That's what we need in America today. Today, uh, 360 to 70,000 churches in America, and we know that statistically four out of five of those churches are either plateaued out or they're declining. Four out of five. But the wonderful thing to think about as you begin this new church, did you know that 80%, get this, 80% of new believers in the United States come to Christ in churches that are less than two years old. 80% of the people who get saved in America today, they get saved in a church that's less than two years old. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that, that's true, but, you know, the older we get, we tend to turn inside. And that happens to churches. But why, why is church planning so important? Because we need more churches. And uh, planting churches to multiple strengths. Every church has its, has its strengths, and every church, just like each one of us individuals. We have strengths, don't we, as individuals? We have weaknesses. And churches are like that. We have a great God. We have a great Savior. We have a great gospel and we all don't, we want, we want to see God glorified in mo local churches here in America and all over the world. Amen. And if we could multiply enough churches with different strengths and weaknesses, then if you take the whole sum total of that, we would be closer to meeting the crying needs of our world today if we had more churches. So it's not just evangelism, it's church planting too. And that's what you're a part of. And, and, and as I said, we... We applaud you. We are going to pray for you. We commit to pray for you. And we'll have a prayer at the end of our service today. And so that, that brings us to the focus of God's work in establishing a new church in South Germantown. Cornerstone Baptist Church. But I think it's proper for us to look at the biblical setting. What did Jesus say about this? Representing the apostles, Peter had spoken this foundational truth. <laughs> you said, who do you say I am? What did, Christ, what did Peter say? Who? The Christ, the Son of the living God. The Messiah, you're the Messiah, you're the promised one. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And on that statement, on that foundational truth of the church, Jesus made a tremendous statement and a promise that we're going to look at here in just a moment. So basically, Peter and all the apostles, as Ephesians 2 says, became the foundation of the early church. I want to make just four quick observations and we'll be finished tonight. As we think about this tremendous promise of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice what he says. I. Jesus said, I. I will build my church. Who is this I <laughs> who made this promise? Well, Revelation chapter 5 tells us, you know, John had this revelation. And if you get to the fifth chapter, we went through the book of Revelation not too long ago, Brother Jim, didn't we? On Wednesday nights. But you get to that fifth chapter, and uh, we're, we're in heaven beholding the, the throne of God, and in his hand is a, a scroll, which I believe was the unfolding of the end of history and the destiny of the church. And you remember what happens there? At first, no one is seen worthy to open the scroll, to bring history to its appointed consummation. And John tells us in his revelation there, he, he, he weeps. He begins weeping because there's no one worthy to take the scroll. And then one of the 24 elders says this, verse 5, Weep no more, because the lion of the tribe of Juba, Judah has conquered and is worthy to open the scroll. Don't cry, don't weep anymore. The lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. And then that lion-like lamb and that lamb-like lion 
takes the scroll, and as he takes the scroll, if you remember there, if you look in your Bible, the elders and all the creatures that were around that throne begin Brother Monty singing. And this is what they say. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were, were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Folks, one person is worthy to bring history to its appointed consummation. And who is that? The Christ, the Son of the living God. He's ransomed people, he says, from every ethnic people on the planet. But I was reading this as we studied it, and I didn't share it with the folks on Wednesday night, but there's two astonishing things that happen here. You remember reading this. Millions of angels and talking birds and horses and fish confirm the greatness of Christ. It says in verse 11, Paul, uh, John says, And I heard the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And if you do your math, that means at least two million, but probably more. And they're saying with a loud voice, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And he says, I heard every creature in heaven, birds and butterflies, and on earth, horses and tigers and squirrels, which my wife hates because they're taking over our yard. But, uh, uh, and under the earth, he says, worms and molds, which I hate, and, and uh, uh, groundhogs, and in the sea, fish and squid and lobsters and, and whales. And all of them, it says, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And it says there, the four living creatures said, Good Baptist, Amen. Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And who were they worshipping? The Christ, the Son of the living God. And he is the I here. This is the one who said, I will build my church. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Look at the second phrase here. He says, I will build. I will build. You know, the church is not a building. It's, it's a people with or without a building. The Bible pictures this people of God sometimes as a tree that grows and sometimes as a building that's built. But the point is that this people have a builder. <laughs> and that builder is... Jesus builds the church. Jesus builds the church. And how does he do it? He, by ripping down the gates that hold the human heart that is hell bound. How did, we're, we're studying Philippians on Sunday night, so let's uh, delve into it real quickly here. How, how, did, how did Jesus build the church in Philippi? If you remember in Acts chapter 16, he used... Uh, we know for sure he used three different people. One of them was a, a lady by the name of Lydia. And it says in Acts 16, verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to give heed to the word. And then an unusual one, it says there that there was a demon-possessed slave girl. We hear these words, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. She was saved. But then in the 18th verse, this, there was this pagan city employee who worked at the local jail. <laughs> we call him the Philippian jailer. <laughs> you remember what was happening, don't you? Brother John, Brother John, those of us who, Brother Ed on the mission, they were, they were out on their mission journey and they got put in jail. <laughs> and the Bible says there in the 16th chapter that, that Paul and Silas were, were, were in the stocks 
in the innermost part of the prison, and they were singing praises to God, and God blew open the door, blew the, the doors open with an earthquake, and he also blew the gate off of that jailer's heart, <laughs> and he came to Christ. Actually, his whole household came to Christ. Paul, Paul was Jesus' instrument but it was Jesus who built the church in Philippi. And he is the one who's building this church here in Olive Branch. And he's the one who's building the church in South Germantown. Jesus said, I will build my church. But notice also he says here, my I will build my church. God, the Bible says, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. And not only us, but millions who are scattered throughout the world as, as uh, the Lord Jesus said to John in, in John 10, 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I will bring. <laughs> he had, and remember when Paul was in a certain city, the Holy Spirit came to him. He was getting discouraged. He was ready to leave. <laughs> what did the Holy Spirit say? I got many people in this city. Believe it or not, God's got many people up there in South Germantown who are yet to come into the kingdom. He bought them with his own blood. We sang about he says he will make them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. <laughs> they will be his church. His church. Jesus said, my church. Not their own. They were not their own. They were bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. They're his. And he will gather them and he will build his church. His church, not your church, not my church. I know we use those pronouns a lot. I caught myself saying, you know, this is our, our church. No, th this is Jesus' church. Jesus builds his church. I will build my church. And then that last word, church, ecclesia, the called out ones. It's, thrill it's, it's thrilling. It's a thrilling thing to me that, that we are celebrating and coming alongside you uh, to, tonight. A church in the making. Not, not just a ministry. It's not a ministry, but a church. Being built by who? Christ, the son of the living God. Out of hell-bound lives. He's, he's building his church. Jesus does not promise that he will build his school. He does not promise that he will build his co-op. He, he does not promise he will build his medical clinic. He does not promise that he'll build his university. He does not promise that he will build his social uh, service agency as good as all those things are. Jesus said, I will build my church. My church. My church. And we believe this, don't we? <laughs> We stand on this. And he says the gates of hell, or Hades, will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus has a real radical way, folks. I like what Tim said, you know. He'd seen it overseas, church planning. It's a, it's a radical thing. Jesus has a radical way of building his church. He says the gates of death or the gates of Hades, the place of the departed dead, the gates of death will stop, not stop him from rescuing people from death. You see, the Lord Jesus, he will open the doors of Hades from the inside. <laughs> he got in by dying. God coming down in human flesh, living that perfect holy life that none of us can live on our own, and dying that horrible death on the cross for our sins, and then being raised. But Jesus went into death. He went down into death. 
He gets into Hades by death, but he gets out by the resurrection. And now the Bible says the gates and the keys to death are his. Jesus, the risen Christ, says in Revelation 1.18, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. You see, the keys were on the inside. <laughs> That's why he went in. And when he came out, he brought the keys with him. Now he will build his church. How do we join him? How do we become a part of this? We do what he did. Verse I learned as a young man in Union University many years ago means so much to me again today. Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how we join him. Will we join him in dying to self, dying to this world and living to Christ? Jesus said, whoever loses his life for Christ and the gospel will find it and bring others through the gates of death into life. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. If you're here tonight, I trust that you know the Lord, that, you've, that there's been a point in your life where you repented of your sin, acknowledged your sin, and you repented of your sin, and you trusted in Jesus Christ. But you know, I've been a missionary, for, I was a missionary for a long time, I guess I still am, but uh, just got a different mi mission field, Brother John. <laughs> but you know, you can be a member of a church, still be lost. Actually, I, I know a couple of pastors who were pastors and got saved. You know, the heart is deceitful above all else, desperately wicked, who can know it? I want us to stand tonight. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted in Jesus, come to the Lord. It's not just coming down this aisle, but come to the Lord. If you're here tonight and, and uh, God is calling you to be a part of this uh, church plant and you hadn't committed yet,